It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Happy Saturday evening or Sunday morning, I guess, depending on where you live. Uh, welcome to my coverage of Rocket Lab launching a NASA payload. This is the fourth time ever that Rocket Lab is launching from their beautiful, beautiful launch pad out there in New Zealand. And like always, as I'm doing nowadays, uh, we're going to get you guys trained on, uh, on doing these rundowns anytime you want. So you can just go to my website, everydayastronaut.com, click on the pre-launch previews at the top, and voila, we have a little countdown. This launch is going to take off. Oh, look at that funny thing. Hmm. Um, there is an issue with this. Well, we're going to have a huge countdown clock. <laughs> um, so uh, pre-launch previews, you can click on the actual launch. You see that this is in 29 minutes and 44 seconds, which is the same thing you should see there on the screen as well and look you can click here and you can see everything you need to know so uh yeah we have uh we have this taking off hopefully in uh again 29 minutes the company is rocket lab they're a uh, i i'm not even going to describe it right anymore because you know any everyone wants to everyone wants to own rocket lab both the united states wants to take credit for it and so does new zealand Really, it is. Uh, it's a New Zealand-backed. I mean, everything is is really basically New Zealand, but they have to have the avionics and the engines produced here in the United States. So they're kind of like a. So we're, we kind of do some things here in the United States, and they're going to have a launch pad here in the United States. But they're also a very New Zealand company, uh, mostly New Zealand run and operated, which is awesome. Uh, very bright group of individuals. Um, yeah, the the customer on today's mission is NASA. That's really exciting. Um, the launch location is their gorgeous launch pad, LC-1, out of the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. 
Uh, I haven't been out there, but my friends right now, Trevor and Brady, uh, Trevor Malman and Brady Kenningston, two uh, fellow rocket photographers are out there right now in New Zealand hoping to get a, a beautiful shots out there. I can't wait to see what they get from this launch. Um, I'm very jealous. I definitely have to do that. 2019, I think, is going to be the year that I go down, um, I guess, again to New Zealand, but to catch a launch this time. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, if you guys are having, we've had a couple people mention that it might look a little grainy, the video. Uh, refresh your thing. I don't know. I've had problems with the encoder lately. Nothing has changed on my end here, but I don't know what's happening uh, with YouTube lately. So I apologize for that. Uh, if that's the case for you, but today's payload is relatively light. It's 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 actually really light. It's lighter than me, in fact, uh, and it's still a bunch of satellites. There's um, like a dozen or so, or nineteen, or eighteen, or ten, or so, a, a bunch of little tiny CubeSats in this thing. Um, but it's it's the first of the Venture class missions for NASA. They announced. I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. Um, but these uh, these are going out to low Earth orbit. Uh, at 500 kilometers in altitude, at an 85 degree inclination, so basically a polar orbit. Boosters are not recoverable, um, it'll crash in the ocean, no fairing recovery on these vehicles. This is the fourth launch of the Electron, third launch for Electron this year, for Rocket Lab this year. Uh, that's amazing, they went from, you know, they just launched about a month ago, maybe, yeah, just almost exactly a month ago, and I'm telling you, I, I told you guys this when I went and visited them in New Zealand, once they're fired up and going, they're going to be an unstoppable rocket company because they are just going to be just I, I can't even begin to describe how how they already had like seven rockets on the floor. I, and I knew once they got it ready to go, they're just going to start turning these launches out like you wouldn't believe. So here we are. We're seeing the fruits of that labor. I'm going to get a beautiful image here from Jeff Barrett. If you want to just see the simple rundown here, uh, here you go. Low Earth orbit ride share mission. So. Here's here's all the the satellites on here, and again, thanks to John Rump for for getting this stuff all together. Um, these are the actual satellites that are going to be on board. These are ten CubeSats. That's how many ten um, that are are part of this new idea, um, basically for NASA to do these venture class missions. Um, so here we go. So these they this was announced. The contract award winners were announced in 2015. Um, they were given, a contract was given to Firefly, uh, in Texas, Rocket Lab in the United States, Virgin Galactic, which is also hoping to fly, hoping to fly. That's now Virgin Orbit. Um, that's, that's technically kind of same umbrella company, of course, Virgin, but Virgin Galactic is the, you know, the, the suborbital tourism that just had a successful launch the other day. It looked gorgeous. I believe that was the highest Spaceship Two has ever flown. So congratulations, uh, Virgin Galactic. I'm so Excited and ready for you to get people in there, paying customers going. I can't wait. Uh, this is Virgin Orbit that won this contract. I think at the time it was actually all still considered Virgin Galactic, but then they ended up splitting off. Virgin Orbit's taking a 747 and dropping a rocket off it. They're big into the air launch stuff, so I'll definitely have an air launch video ready when they start to uh, do this. So they're also going to be flying this venture class. The idea is a lot of satellites these days are tiny. They're CubeSats. You know, they're like the size of a shoebox. And... They normally have to do these ride shares and they don't, you know, you might be waiting years to be able to line up with the right mission parameters and all these different things and, and spending a lot because you're kind of a secondary, you're literally, not kind of, you're literally a very secondary payload. So uh, these CubeSats and some of these are really cool little CubeSat demonstrators and, and science experiments that are, that are just small, uh, you know, nowadays with microchips and things, a lot of technology can shrink. Uh, and this rocket is basically designed to cater to that market. Um, and here's again, a look, I, I was there just, when was this October? I went and visited rocket lab. I got to go inside their factory. It is basically a modern art museum. If you can't tell, look at that entryway. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Look at this rocket just hanging from the sea. Oh, this is their mission control. It's like a, the most beautiful evil layer slash gorgeous, awe inspiring thing ever. Uh, yeah, so, uh, look at that, yeah, it's a really cool factory, um, one of the cool things, of course, this rocket has, I think, three really unique identifying features, uh, probably the most obvious is that it's black, a completely black rocket, why is it black? It's carbon fiber, well, carbon composite, 
And uh, that makes it extremely, extremely light. That's one of the ways that it was able to to do what it can do. It can take about 250 kilograms up into orbit. Um, but it's extremely lightweight. Uh, I can't even tell you how lightweight it is. Uh, I pushed one of these around with my bare hands. It's it's crazy. It, it, like, you can easily just push it like this. And it just moves around. They're so lightweight, um, which is really, really cool. Uh, there's the CEO, Peter Beck. We did a sit down interview. Um, yeah. So basically what I'm getting at, it, okay. So the, the things that, that rocket lab does differently, they have that, uh, they do, uh, the carbon fiber. They also do electric turbo pumps. And that's something that has never been done commercially before. Uh, so you basically remove all the complexity of having a, a turbo pump and all that, uh, all the, in order to do, like, I, uh, I can't even tell you how difficult that is and how that's easily one of the most things that, the most common things that fails on rockets is the turbo machinery. Um, so they got to simplify it a ton by literally just having software replacing hardware. They, they have really powerful pumps. These little tiny pumps, if you speak horsepower like me, because I'm uh, from, you know, America and we just talk horsepower. Uh, I believe uh, Peter Beck said each one that's about the size of a Coke can or, you know, something about this size produces 110 horsepower. Uh, I, th I believe it's 60 kilowatts, kilovolts, kilowatts. Yeah, which is crazy. And it takes that much power to be able to, to pressurize the combustion chamber of these of, of a rocket engine. The pressure from the turbo pumps has to be greater than the internal pressure of the combustion chamber. Uh, but it's crazy that they're able to do it with electric turbo pumps. Um, yeah, what happened to the countdown again? Get back in there, guys. I'm just riding the struggle bus today with this. I bet everyone's going to be like this. Watch this. It's going to freak out again. Thanks a lot, OBS. OBS, you used to be my best friend. And now, look at what you've done. Well, there you go. Enjoy. Enjoy some some randomness. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't know how much torque, probably a, a crap ton, probably a lot because electric motors, of course, uh, have instant torque. They have torque applied the second they're spinning. They're at max peak torque. That is one of the beauties of, uh, of an electric turbo pump over anything like, uh, an internal combustion engine and things like that. So there you go. That's two of the things. What's the other thing that's crazy unique, um, crazy unique about rocket lab. There's something else that I, that I always want to think about that I think is really cool. Um, I don't know. I just think they're awesome. Um, their second stage. Oh, they do. So since it's electric powered, they ditch the batteries on the second stage. And that's actually by ditching the batteries about halfway through the second stage burn. That's how they're able to get a significant payload into orbit. If it wasn't for ditching those batteries, they, it really wouldn't quite close. But of course, Rocket Lab is betting on technology that's improving. So they're betting on, on battery technology, which is one of the most aggressive industries period right now you know if, if you everything runs on batteries cars run on batteries now our phones computers laptops everything has a crazy lithium-ion battery so of course they're just going to be reaping the benefits of that they're reaping the benefits of an industry that's fighting to make a lighter weight cheaper more dense energy and from now on in say in a year and a half they might be able to get 20 percent greater performance out of the batteries which could significantly increase the performance of their rockets just by swapping out batteries and changing some software. I think that's really cool. I think that's a very 21st century thing to do. Um, the only thing left is if they would start trying to recover these things someday, which I, this is pure speculation. I wouldn't put it past them. It, that would not surprise me at all. If, if someday they look at this and go, yeah, we've got it figured out, you know, as they have more margins someday and things like that. So uh, first, thanks, Youth Salant and Nugget and Neil Libby. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your tips. Um, oh, I need to remind you, I have people telling me that I am terrible at this. I have people asking me all the time, why don't I have a podcast? I would love if you did a Rocket podcast. I do have a podcast, but I just haven't been talking about it very much. Um, it's called Our Ludicrous Future. Um, it's 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 two other YouTubers and I. Um, Joe Scott from Answers with Joe, Ben Solens from Teslanomics, and I. And... We all just talk about it's. It's called our ludicrous future. It's a little bit of a nod to uh, to Elon Musk. It, it's kind of ends up being like three fanboys of Elon Musk. But it's we we're pretty critical of things that are are going wrong. But we all have very different uh, similar similar mindsets on things. But I really enjoy talking to these guys because uh, 
we all kind of dabble in different things. So I'm obviously kind of the, the guy that's obsessed with rockets. Uh, Joe is a big futurist and, and likes to, to look at, um, you know, I don't know, like kind of medicine and future thinking and future technology, uh, just random stuff. That's what I like is he brings in these really random perspectives and really random stories. And then Besla is a data guy that's obsessed with Tesla. So if you guys are looking for a podcast to, to make sure and subscribe our ludicrous future, um, I'll, I may, I might have that linked in the description. If not, just look it up. It's hard to spell though. I, I have to tell myself every time I spell it, Lou die Kraus. Otherwise I cannot spell ludicrous. Um, and it's not like the rapper. And there also used to be a hardcore band called ludicrous that later became Norma Jean. Um, yeah. So our ludicrous future, uh, find us, listen to us wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and you can hopefully get a little bit of extra rocket news out of me that way. If you're looking for that weekly craving. Oh, that's the other thing. Super Numex, thank you. 3D printed engines is another thing. They turn around engines in 24 hours and they're entirely, three, basically entirely 3D printed. Um, and they have nine of these, uh, I don't have pictures on here because that's the part that I couldn't take pictures of is the actual like power packs themselves. Um, let me pull up a little, a little picture here of the Electron. Uh, I'll just go to Rocket Lab's website. And we'll just take a take a little peekaroo here at it because it is really, really, really cool. Um, so they kind of have a similar launch configuration to SpaceX um, where they with the Falcon 9. And it's not like a ripoff. I mean, it's just a similarity uh, in their vehicle where it has nine common engines on the main stage like this on, on the first stage. There's nine Rutherford 3D printed engines that are electric powered. Uh, and then there's a single Rutherford engine on the upper stage. Wow, why is it so long? I don't think it's this long in real life. Is this like an error in the <laughs> website? It's They now stretched it to 874 meters in alti height. altitude height. Alta height. Um, yeah, so there, there's an upper stage as well. It's a single vacuum optimized Rutherford engine. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the three things. Yeah, 3D printed, electric, and uh, carbon fiber. They also have a kick stage. It's kind of like a mini third stage. Uh, and that's able to, especially like in missions like this where they're deploying 10 different CubeSats, they can actually slightly change their orbits for all 10 of those CubeSats and then deorbit that kick stage, be good space stewards and all of that. So your friend is a fabricator at Rocket Lab. That is awesome, Stefan. Dang, I met some really cool people at Rocket Lab. They have a great team out there. Uh, Tuba Horse, hey, hey, excited to see the Electron launch again. Missed the first one. Uh, the Missed the first time it was streamed live. Well, this is actually the fourth time. So you've technically missed three, but welcome. Uh, these are really fun to watch. So hopefully they get their live stream pulled up here soon. And when they do, I will pull it on up here as well. And I'm just in the meantime, I'm just going to keep their their Twitter feed rolling up here in the corner in case anything happens. In case we get any other updates, but I think so far we're, we're on track. We're tracking a, an on-time launch in 15 minutes. Spencer, I have learned so much from you this year. Just promoted myself to a payload specialist because you deserve it. Cheers to successful, successful 2019. Thank you so much, Spencer. Uh, I really enjoyed our exclusive Patreon live stream today. It's fun just like very willy-nilly talking. I like that I don't have to like prepare anything when I do Patreon live streams. I just get to like tell you guys what's up in my day. Uh, answer fun questions about rockets. Um, and I, yeah, I, I hope I say this often enough, but I really couldn't be doing what I do without my Patreon supporters. So thank you, Spencer. Thank you to the rest of my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to help uh, me do what I do, and if you want to join some exclusive live streams where you can get more answers about rockets and stuff, feel free to visit patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Um, nice links for new here. First live stream with me. Well, welcome. Welcome to uh, Everyday Astronaut Livestream. This is a good one to watch because this will be Rocket Lab and hopefully they turn this live stream on here any second. If they don't, I might have to, uh, I might have to refresh the feed, but it should pop up any second now because I think they stream about T minus 15. Do I know anything about the Delta, Delta 5 launch failure? Um, I think you're referring to the Delta IV Heavy launch, um, that was the other night. It wasn't a failure, it's just a scrub. They didn't really give us any information. Um, it's important to make sure to understand, we got really spoiled this year. I feel like there is a record number of not scrubbed rocket launches. I swear to you, like 2015, 20, 
2015 and 2016, the beginning of 2016, when SpaceX was especially working on trying to get their uh, super chilled propellants and super chilled oxidizer, when they were trying to figure that out, they would scrub literally, I, it was like every time, like two or three or four times per launch, a uh, couple back to back. I think it was like SES-8 um, and maybe like JC Sat or something like A few of those in a row were like scrub, 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 scrub. So I'd stay up watching them and, uh, you know, wake up early or, or go to bed really late watching these. <laughs> so I think I, I learned my patience pants there from uh, 2015 or 2016. Um, so yeah, um, scrubs are pretty normal. Um, a man, uh, man of sand says, are there any chances of their kick stage, um, evolving into anything else? Uh, that's, I, I don't quite know what it could evolve into. Um, the one potential would be, say they are able to gain a little additional performance out of the Rutherford engines and a little additional, uh, burn time basically out of their, their, their battery packs. Maybe a third stage could be upgraded, you know, with a little bit more propellant, increasing the overall Delta V potentially. I don't know. I don't know how you'd really upgrade the third stage or what you could do, but yeah. Um, yeah. How many rockets have failed? So um, so with Rocket Lab, it's interesting because they, again, I'm going to refresh this just to make sure I'm not missing out on something. I would hate to totally miss out, but I think we're still on track. Um how, so Rocket Lab, their first launch of the, of the Electron was actually going completely perfectly. And luckily, they made it through most of the things. They made it through stage separation. They made it through uh, second stage, stage ignition. And they actually lost telemetry on the rocket. So it was a ground station failure that caused them to have to, to pull the plug and, and, and abort the mission. Um, so, if it, so the rocket itself was performing perfectly nominal. And for a test flight... That's unbelievable. They got all the data they needed to verify basically every system on the vehicle, which is uh, massively important. You know, even clearing the pad on your first flight is is a, a huge achievement. Making it through stage separation is another huge achievement. You know, igniting the second stage, going right on the on on the line, and just having the the ground tracking stations is that's the only failure they've had. So I'm expecting really big things from this company. They really really seem um, to just have it nailed down. Um, Thaddeus Walker says third stage could become a reusable orbital, reusable orbital towing. It's really small. It's like this big. It's, it probably only has a very small amount of Delta V in it or, or not in it, but like Delta V available for any reasonable size payload. So I don't, th yeah, I don't know. I, um, Twitter's live. Hmm. 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 I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But uh, hopefully, I hope they get going here. Maybe they're going to do a shorter live cast tonight. But I, I sure hope we hope we, uh, we get it tonight. I, I'm excited. Um, uh, Stefan, G&G uh, &G got uh, to talk about Tesla Megapack in Canberra on the pat podcast. Uh, am I going to talk about the Tesla Megapack in Canberra? Uh, maybe Ben will. I'm not up to snuff on that. Um, but thank you for saying hi. And uh, yeah, I'm sure Ben or, or Joe will probably talk about that. I, I I don't end up saying too much about that stuff. Why well, I, I do. I talk a lot about Tesla because I like Tesla. Uh, hey, James, say hi to Sean Devine. Hi, Sean Devine. So what's my favorite operational rocket? I would say... Um, this is easily up there. The, I don't know what it is. I think the Electron is super cool. Uh, it breaks a lot of molds, does a lot of things differently. Um, easily up there. It, it's top three for sure. But for me, it's really hard to beat the Falcon 9 and or Falcon Heavy um, because of the whole landing thing. And I really like them. And they're really cool. Oh, they did. Okay, it looks like they pushed back to 26 minutes. That's probably, it looks like they must have pushed their clock back a little bit. So, um, we can hit, we can wait 17 more minutes. No big deal. No big deal. Um, let's see here. Let's read some stuff here. Uh, t yeah, T minus. Okay, so that we do have a new tweet. Uh, yep. New target is T minus zero at 633. So, yeah. 17 minute and look at that my clock updated already 
<laughs> oh, we live in the future here, folks. That is awesome. Ah, oh, that is so great. Got a big crew around at my place for this launch, introducing them to Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and they are loving it. Well, thank you, Rocket Max, in our Discord channel. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Max down there in New Zealand. I gotta say, I love those Kiwis. You guys are some awesome people. I don't know what it is about people in New Zealand. Everyone was so nice. Everyone was like super, there's just like this whole attitude about everyone, at least in Auckland. I guess I didn't really go too much beyond Auckland for that trip, but like, it just felt like everyone's just like super like, yeah, what's up? Let's hang out. What are you doing? I don't know. Like very chill. I like that Kiwi attitude. Um, okay. So, uh, favorite rockets. So yeah, definitely. These are, those are my two, I guess I'm, I might be biased towards rockets that have nine engines on one stage and another one on the other. Uh, will we see government missions with large crews? Asks Jason. Yeah. Um, so for instance, don't forget commercial crew programs can fly three or four. Technically they could fly seven people, uh, but they'll be flying up to four people up to the international space station. Those are government, government missions. Um, that's not a large crew. Maybe, uh, I mean, four is pretty good. <laughs> it's more than we've seen, um, in about eight years, you know, don't forget, Ever since 2011, when the space shuttle ended, we've been flying on a Soyuz capsule that's about the size of this chair that can <laughs> that has to fit three cosmonauts and or astronauts. So uh, I, I'd say at this point, four is a good size. I don't know if that's what you mean. I don't know how big of um, government missions you're talking about with large crews, but I would say four is a large crew, a good healthy crew at least. Um, and I'm really excited to see those flying. Those are going to be happening in 2019 with both Boeing and their CST-100 Starliner. And then, of course, SpaceX with their Dragon 2 capsule. Uh, returning astronauts and, and, and cosmonauts and anyone, any kind of not to space from U.S. soil. I'm really excited for that. That's going to be awesome. Um, yeah. Miles Miller. Hey, Tim. Uh, hello again from Iowa. Yes. Another Iowan. Uh... Loving your stuff is always quick question. In cases of failures where they can't recover the failed parts, such as Apollo 13 service module, how do they know exactly what happened that detail? That's a really good question, Miles. So I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, someone asked in a live stream or something, you know, what if they had cameras? Do do spacecraft have, have cameras to be able to check out and and see, you know, what's wrong if there's any problems? Like what if a satellite's out there? It has a 15 year lifespan and something goes wrong. Is there a camera on there that can like go out and, and check out the thing? And the, the answer is honestly, data is almost more important and tells you way more of a detail than what a, a visual could. Um, looking at telemetry, looking at, uh, you know, if in the instance of a, a Apollo 13, they knew exactly it was right when he stirred the cryo, you know, the oxygen tanks, that exact moment. Um, they, there's a lot of other sensors and data. They can literally piece it back together forensically almost because there's logs. And especially in modern rockets, there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of channels of data all over. That's why SpaceX was able to figure out what happened with the Amos 6 anomaly. So, um, two years ago, September 1st, 2006, SpaceX was doing a, a fuel up of a Saturn or <laughs> of a Saturn five. Yeah. SpaceX bought a Saturn five and was fueling up. SpaceX was fueling up a Falcon 9 rocket like they do all the time, and they were doing one of their hold down static fire tests. And, and out of nowhere, before they even lit the engines, like a, a good amount before, the entire vehicle erupted. And yes, they had a ton of camera angles, but the way they really solved, and they have high speed cameras on those things, pointed anytime there's fuel flowing, there's like terabytes of data from high speed footage being pulled back from even static fires, everything. They have cameras galore. But the real way they figured out what went wrong was from the telemet from the data inside the vehicle. They're actually able to trace and and triangulate where the exact which COPV failed at exactly what time down to the milliseconds. They were measuring in between like hertz to be able to figure out where exactly the failure was. And so in that case, data can tell you way more, uh, paint a way more clear picture than just having even high speed 4K footage all around the vehicle. Um, yes, of course, getting in, like say, you know, you had Apollo 13, you're able to like safely bring the service module down and, and totally take a look at it with your own eyes and dig into it and take it apart. That would probably be one of the best other types of forensic evidence. But at the same time, the, the data, the telemetry off the vehicle is extremely valuable. All right, hope, hope that answers your question. That was a long one, sorry. <laughs> Paul Allen. 
Silver button looks good on the wall. Thank you. Yes. Uh, where is it? I, oh, yeah. It's right there. That's always hard to do mirrored. Right there. Silver play button. Yeah. And now we are at 200. That happened in less than nine months, I realized. Uh, it was, uh, I think, March 11th or 12th is when I was able to get to 100,000 of this year. We just hit 200,000 in like nine months. I, I'm floored. Thank you guys. Thank you for showing your friends. Thank you for watching all the old videos and coming back and checking out the new videos. I am ecstatic and I'm absolutely floored. I had no idea that uh, that, that was going to happen. Uh, <laughs> trust me, I, when I, I you have to realize that it was only a year before that. So it was like March, end of February of 2017 is when I like first made my first YouTube video for like nobody. You know, no one saw it. So back then when I first put that one up there, if I thought it was going to hit 200,000 before within two years, you would, I would have said you're absolutely lying. So thank you guys. I, I literally couldn't do it without you. Like I, that's just factually speaking. If it wasn't for you people subscribing, I wouldn't have that. So thank you. Um, Mary Smith. Hey, Tim. want to say hi. Loved your Patreon video today. Looking forward to more of those. Keep being awesome and doing what you do. Thank you, Mary. That is very sweet of you. I'm working on accepting compliments like that more and like letting them actually sink in because there's a lot of negativity on the internet and I love that my community has become such a positive reinforcement and we're such a positive community that's able to help other people understand. Um, and I, I like that we're all working to educate and teach each other. That to me is awesome. That's like the most valuable type of community you can have is one that's positive and fosters uh, critical thinking, scientific literacy, and, and just a further desire to be uh, educated about things that are really complicated, like rocket science. I love that we're figuring this all out together. So thank you very much, Mary. Ryan Gordon. Um, let's see. Thanks, Tim, for all you, uh, for all you do for us space enthusiasts. Congrats on breaking that 200,000 mark. Thank you. Got an F1 shirt from your web store and you love it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take that, that minute to, uh, to find the, here's the F1 shirt. This is actually, this besides our Buran uh, Limited. By the way, if you ordered a Buran shirt or grid fins, uh, the Buran shirt we did that pre-order run that ended December 1st. They went into production at the beginning of December. Uh, we had a limited number of those, uh, the tri-blend shirts that we ordered. So those are were produced like last week. They started shipping, I believe, at the end of the week or mon most of them on Monday of next week. They should be to you by the holidays. Uh, we're doing expedited shipping on, on those that are we are nervous that they aren't going to make it to you. So those got slammed. I can't – we way overdid it with the brand shirts. Uh, whoops. <laughs> you guys absolutely – we doubled the output of the store that I'm working with. It's new fulfillment. Um, they're a local print shop in California in Long Beach. And uh, we doubled their entire output, like period. Uh, they got slammed. So your patience is – Absolutely, like I, I can't thank you enough for being patient with me on this. Um, and especially those grid fins. I have a guy named Spencer. He had to order a second laser cutter because he's like, he's overwhelmed. He 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 can't keep up with our demand. And uh, yeah, I guess it's a good thing we're in, as Elon Musk would call it, we're in production hell right now. Um, but we're working on it. We're working on getting our stock back up. And uh, so it, I would still appreciate some patience. If you have any questions on that, you can email shop at everydayastronaut.com, but just give it a, give it a week or two. Um, like I said, almost anything, if you ordered it, um, yeah, just, it should be there by the holidays, which I hope is what matters. So, um, yeah. So again, thank you for your patience, but yeah, we have, uh, what was the other thing? Oh yeah. I'm adding new shirts. Oh, this is one of my, this one sold out too really quickly. A lot of these did, um, this new Falcon family shirt. Um, I love this one. Yeah. So yeah. Check those out. We have uh, some exclusive shirts. I think that I'm launching next week. December's exclusive shirt. So get ready for that. Those are always pre-orders. I will always do a pre-order run. And then that's like it. After after the, the time closes, it's like a limited time thing. We will not accept orders on those. Um, 15 minutes. Hopefully they... It says they're live. That's a good thing. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. Um, I also know for a fact that this song always gets <laughs> absolutely demonetized instantly. Um, Ryan, thank you. Yeah, perfect, Ryan. Thank you so much. Sarmon of Flynn. And by the way, guys, once they start talking, I'm going to be just giving a good old listen. Um, 
and I'll get back to your questions as soon as I can too. So, um, what do you think of the Australian Space Agency comms protocol will sound like? Give that all astronauts will be named Bruce. <laughs> hey, Bruce. <laughs> That's great. I don't have an answer for that, but that is really funny. Uh, Philip, thanks for being awesome for their thanks for your awesome space coverage, Tim. You're welcome, Philip. Jeff, your sixth grade students love you. Thanks for your public service. Well, thank you. Tell your students hi from from Tim. All right, here we go. And and Royal Gaming, thank you. Hello, launch fans, and welcome to today's live webcast of Rocket Lab's fourth electron launch, the Alana 19 mission for NASA. We are broadcasting to you live from Launch Complex One on New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula and Rocket Lab Mission Control in Auckland. It is Sunday, December 16th, and we are preparing for electron liftoff approximately 16 minutes from now. My name is Amanda Stiles, and I'm a senior mission manager here at Rocket Lab. I'll be your guide through today's launch activities. You're looking at a live view Sorry, of the electron launch thing. vehicle at Launch Complex One. Today's mission will be Rocket Lab's third orbital mission for 2018. Thirteen CubeSats will be launched as part of today's mission, and many of these spacecraft are getting their ride to orbit through a NASA program called CubeSat Launch Initiative. This exciting program recognizes that CubeSats are playing an increasingly significant role in exploration, tech demonstration, research, and education. Small spacecraft like the ones launching today are opening opportunities for fast and cost-effective research and commercial applications in space. One of my favorite things is, remember, this rocket's black. So <laughs> why is it white and black now? Um, that's ice. That's how cold the fuselage is of this vehicle. Because don't forget that liquid oxygen and liquid propellant, especially the liquid oxygen, is like minus 180 degrees Celsius. So as um, the condensation in the air comes in contact with that really, really, just like a really cold, you know, soda can gets that condensation. Or if you... Uh, like if you live here in now Iowa. let's listen for the final go or no go from Mission Control. Yes. Come on. It's beautiful. Look at how pretty it is out there. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, like I said, though, isn't that crazy? That's ice. It's still Mission a black Control rocket. Mission Control has given the go for flight, and our flight director has given the final go to proceed with launch, which will take place in just under 13, 14 minutes from now. Electron is fueled and ready at Launch Complex 1 with Electron Go, Range Go, and the Weather Go. We've also informally pulled the sheep and their go as well. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. They pulled the sheep pulled the sheep in there go to that's that's cute uh so yeah again uh black rocket it's carbon composite carbon fiber um but the parts that are white are where Today's you see mission is called alana 19. alana stands for educational launch of nano satellites and this is the 19th alana mission by nasa in addition to the mission name rocket lab also names each electron launch vehicle individually the launch vehicle for Alana 19 is called This One's for Pickering, in honor of New Zealand-born scientist and former director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, Sir William Pickering. For 22 years, Sir William Pickering headed up JPL and led the team that developed the first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1, which launched in 1958. Members of Sir William's family are joining us outside of Mission Control today to watch the launch. It's an honor to have them here with us today. It's awesome. To all operators, my mark will be at minus 12 minutes and counting. Mark. The next the milestone to watch for is retraction of the strong the back. This is the tall black structure supporting Electron. RF, this is the strong back will be pulled away from the vehicle by 22 degrees to protect it from the intense heat of Electron's engines during liftoff. 
Once retracted, Electron will be fully supported by four hold down clamps. So, uh, yeah, that looks like a gorgeous, gorgeous day. Uh, again, my friends. Top lap open, proceeding with strong back. Retract. So the strong back is that, see that, the things up near the top, that's what holds onto the rocket. They take it out there horizontally. And then they pitch the entire thing, the, basically the whole launch structure, gets pitched up into this vertical position. And now the rocket, uh, now that it's fully fueled and pressurized and everything, that strong back will retract. Uh, but you can still see the, the umbilicals there. Those are the, oh, I never realized that they only really have one set of launch umbilicals. That's cool. I wonder, I wonder if then the piping in the interstage, so... See this black part in the middle there? That's the inner stage. That's in between the first and second stage. Um, I wonder if then that splits in half, and half of the piping for the liquid fuel and the oxidizer goes up, and the other Wait, half goes down. On mission call. Yes, sir. Procedure. Today's Alpha mission is significant to Rocket Lab, okay. NASA, and the small satellite industry as a whole. It's the first time NASA CubeSats will enjoy a dedicated ride to orbit thanks to NASA's Venture Class Launch Services Initiative, known as VCLS. NASA has provided a short video to tell us more about the VCLS program, which was put together by students from the Dave School. Enjoy. In the so, beginning of the NASA space program. Um, with this, these always get uh, banned. I watched a bunch of these things. So the, the Alana missions, like I said, or the, the Venture Class missions, are really cool because like this video is basically gonna talk about how they used to require huge, 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 huge rockets like the Saturn V to do really cool exploration things. But nowadays they can just launch these little tiny things. Actually, this video is really cool. I wanna use some of this footage. I love that it's all these historic rockets flying by each other and they keep like surpassing. And there's a really pretty shot at the end with all of them flying really pretty. I'm definitely gonna use some of that together. I wanted to take a quick second though and keep uh, answering you guys' questions. So. Real quick, just for uh, Mr. Bassey, Mr. Basie, I'm going to say it both ways just in case. Mr. Basie, I hope your students study hard and help us get further into space than ever before. And just in case it's the other way, Mr. Bassey, I hope your students study hard and get us further into space than ever before. Good luck. All right, uh, Royal Gaming, you know you're a nerd when you see an everyday astronaut uh, stream and leave a family dinner to watch. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for joining and thanks for saying hi. Um, that I, I would do the same thing. <laughs> uh, by the way, I love that they have the electron in this animation or something similar to it. That is, yeah, that's definitely just like an electron animation, basically. Um, what year do I think humans will land on Mars? <sighs> My position on that has changed a lot. I still think potentially by 20, I think by 2030. Like, I think by the time the year 2030, the clock ticks around on, on the year 2030, I think we'll have humans on the moon. Um, that's just my guess. Total guess. That's my, like, best hope. That's my goal. Who knows? Who knows? Um, or, sorry, did I say the moon? On Mars. Um, Iconium, Iconium 9000. Um, hi, Tim. Can you do a video and talk about the way f uh, the fuel tanks work? I still don't understand the way they use helium. Yes, absolutely. Um this video is about to end and I want to still listen in. Remind me during coast phase, everyone. Um, let's see, especially you guys in my Discord channel, remind me to answer that because that's actually a really good good topic. I would love to tell you about how they backfill with helium. So let's keep that in mind. Okay. While we wait for the remainder of the count, I'll talk to you about some of the key features of the Electron vehicle itself, as well, as well as today's mission. Electron stands at around 17 meters, or 56 feet tall, 
and is a two-stage orbital class rocket fueled by liquid oxygen and highly refined kerosene. The first stage makes up approximately the lower two-thirds of the rocket. At the base of this are nine small and mighty Rutherford engines, which are built at our Huntington Beach headquarters in California. Each engine is 3D printed and features electric pumps, which remove the complexity of traditional gas turbine pumps. These nine engines accelerate electrons through the thickest part of the atmosphere to space. From here, the first and second stage stages separate, and then a single vacuum-optimized Rutherford engine carries the second stage to orbit. This stage separation happens around two and a half minutes into the flight. Then the protective fairing yeah. that safely encapsulates the payloads on ascent will open and separate from the vehicle. Confirmed. RCO, flight on mission call. RCO, go ahead. Switch off FTS ground power and confirm. Stand by. FTS is down. FSO, flight on mission call. FSO, go. FT, I confirm FTS is on internal power. Check tone should be continuous from now. And FSO, please enable FTS fail safe and confirm. Copy. Fail safe up. Fail safe enable down. FTS, this is flight on mission call. Go for flight. Please confirm FTS is green on internal power. FTS is green and go for flight. And to all operators, for now there should be no red flag on your launch commit criteria. Sorry, we're just listening to all kind of this last minute radio Inside chatter. the fairing is FSL Rocket Lab's in-house designed and built kick stage, powered by the 3D printed Curie engine. The payloads are attached to the kick stage, flight which will screen. separate from stage two at around and nine RCO. minutes into flight. flight from here, it's the kick stage coasts for about 40 minutes before the Curie enabled. engine ignites and places the payloads into a 500 by 500 kilometer circular orbit at 85 degrees. At approximately 52 minutes into flight, payload deployment will begin, and then the mission will be complete. At that point, the webcast will conclude, and any further updates we will be pr provided via our website and social media. I have next flight on mission call. Please disable HV bat heaters and confirm, and also HV bat heater fans. Confirm, both disabled. And to all operators on mission call, the vehicle is ready for flight. In a few minutes, the vehicle will enter the final launch auto sequence. Once in this stage, Electron's flight computers will have taken over the vehicle. At any point until T0, our operators can call a hold and pause the countdown. Now let's listen to the mission control audio and follow the final launch sequence. Copy. Yes. Oh, baby. Heart's beating. Three and a half minutes left, guys. I can't wait. Oh, got a little buffering there in the video. I love that it's just like, the crazy thing to me is this vehicle's like ice cold. If you went up and touched this, it'd burn your hand, it's so cold. And then in three and a half minutes, it's gonna be so hot, at least out of one end of the rocket, that uh, it'd also burn you very bad too if you were standing there. Um, the crazy thing too, that I don't think I realized until I did that interview with the CEO of Rocket Lab, uh, which you should definitely watch that video. Um, it's, it's here somewhere in my, go, just search around sometime and find the interview of Peter Beck. Um, he talks about how, I didn't realize they need like a blade of coating even. The vehicle gets so hot on ascent um, from the compression. Again, the, the bow shock, as, as the vehicle's going through the air and air compresses, it gets really, really, really hot. So like around max Q, the vehicle is like, scorching hot again um which i just i don't think i realized that um it makes sense of course it makes sense i i don't know why i never the thought occurred to me that rockets get so hot on ascent even too and not just coming back down too so um yeah so two and a half minutes i hope i thought we we're gonna hear a little more chatter here um but again yes for those i saw someone ask like they use 3d printed engines yeah they're only about this big they're crazy you can physically easily pretty easily pick one up on your own uh they're basically entirely 3d printed which is awesome i've actually seen them do it uh it just goes like micron by micron uh using this like this flight mission call get flat please confirm all av bats have been switched to internal power confirmed vehicles on internal power and rco flight on mission call 
This guy from ground power is disabled on all three stages. That looks like a purge, by the way, that big down. cloud. All operators, vehicles on internet power. It's in locks. That's because, I, I believe, that's because the rocket is uh, is fully pressurized now. So they're purging the liquid oxygen out of the tanks down there, I think. <laughs> I don't know for sure. I would like to... I'll, I'll get that figured out someday. But I, that must just be where the purge valve is. Um, again, as, as oxygen goes yes. from... Yes, right on mission code. Go ahead. Please disable anti-gathering and confirm. Disable Stage one, confirm locks is pressed. Confirmed. Stage two, confirm locks is pressed. Confirmed. Stage one, confirm carry is pressed. Confirmed. Stage two, confirm carry is pressed. Confirmed. Okay. Engine All stages are pressed. Enabling deluge. So now they, that's the call for water deluge. They will uh, pour water near the base of the rocket as sound suppression and to make sure it minimizes damage to the to the launch pad and the ground systems. Using GNC states. Are we reading the engines? Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three. Yes! Oh, it seemed like it got quiet there for a second. Yes! Go, baby! Flight 4 for the Electron, baby! Flight 4, let's do this. Let's see it. Oh, it's going fast! IOP tracking downrange. Yeah. As you just saw, we've had successful liftoff of Rocket Lab's Alana 19 mission. This one's for Pickering. The next major milestone we're coming up to is Max Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure. This is where the forces on the vehicle are at their greatest during launch. Let's stand by for the call. A little sad we lost the launch audio, but it's okay. On stage camera. Approaching maximum dynamic pressure. Now you might see some like vapor cones go by as it goes through max Q. That's always a cool thing you might see. Maximum dynamic pressure. It looks good. Camera looks like it might have some locks or some kind of ice making it look a little bit blurry. You can see the island down there getting smaller and smaller. Bye bye, New Zealand. And notice again, as as the vehicle increases in altitude, um, the air is thinner and thinner, obviously. So the exhaust plume of the engines actually starts to widen and widen out, um, which is why you're seeing that just grow and grow and grow. I hope we <laughs> I want some cleaner pictures than this. Come on, baby. Very office scale. Open power pack CO2 bottles. Coming up next are a series of events that take place in quick succession. These are Actually. MECO, or main engine cutoff, followed by stage one separation, stage two engine ignition, and then fairing jettison. Minimizing Let's listen tank. in. It actually looked like it was getting more and more out of focus. Entering burnout detect mode. Stage one, main engine cutoff. Engine. Good shot of the inner stage there. Nice. Good. This is the second stage, stage now. Stage two propulsion is not at all. Stage two is stable. This is yeah. So this is those are the the giant thing you're seeing up in the top right, uh, where I am. <laughs> that is the uh, the giant battery pack. I'll I'll do this for now. Um. That's one of the giant lithium ion battery packs. And we're actually going to see deploy. two of those. Okay, we might see the fairings pop off 
and fall off in the background there. You can see it. That's so cool. You saw the reflection of one on one side and then the other one go on the other side. I think that was awesome. So that's the fairings. That's the protective nose and cone. And that completes Miko, stage, stage two, one separation, control. second stage ignition, and fairing separation. Electron's second stage is now on its way to orbit. We'll listen in for the call that Electron is orbital at approximately nine minutes into flight. Altitude is 150 kilometers. Now you might notice the, it looks like the engine's sparking a lot. And I believe that's because the nozzle's ablatively cooled. So it's an ablative coat. That means it intentionally sparks off as it heats up. Um, that's the way it cools. It takes some of that heat away with it um, as that ablates away as it leaves. Um, that's kind of common in a few engines. Like for instance, the Delta IV Heavy that will launch on Tuesday night um, uses an ablatively cooled nozzle on its RS-68A engines. Um, yeah, so it's, it might look like it's like, why is it sparking? <laughs> What's wrong? It's spitting out parts. No, it, it is it is supposed to do that. Um, Our next milestone yeah. will be battery hot swap. One of the unique features of Electron is that our Rutherford engine uses electric pumps. These pumps are powered by batteries, but once these batteries run flat, they're just dead weight. To overcome this, we perform a hot swap where we switch from two depleted Extra batteries to a third little. fully charged one. We then jettison the depleted batteries and that mass savings allows a more efficient ride to orbit. Look out for the battery jettison occurring at around T plus seven minutes. Three kilometers per second. All right, so get ready to that. Those, well, soon we'll probably see those jettison, the batteries jettison. And this is, again, ditching those batteries when they are depleted is what allows us to actually have a substantial payload. Because if you carry them all the way through to orbit, um, they would it would substantially, probably almost not even be able to carry much of a payload. But by ditching them, it frees up weight uh, and increases the delta V of the vehicle, making it a pretty great little workhorse. So hopefully... I'm not entirely sure when that happens. That's right. I don't think their timeline over there on the left. It's kind of no longer in like real time mode. That is such a pretty shot of our beautiful planet. So now again, you know, rockets only go up to get out of the atmosphere. Um, if there was no atmosphere, uh, Rockets would not need to go up very high at all. They just have to go high enough to not run into anything on the ground. So the majority of flights for rockets to get into orbit is to go sideways. They have to go horizontally really, really, really fast, uh, like 27,000 miles an hour. Or sorry, 27,000 kilometers an hour. That's about 17,500 miles an hour. That's how a rocket stays in orbit. It will basically... Four kilometers per second. Four kilometers per second. So we're about um, four-sevenths of the way there right now uh, as far as orbital velocity goes. Um so they go up and basically you can think of it like throwing a ball or, or shooting a cannon, you know, a normal ballistic trajectory, just kind of, eh, but if you shoot it further, it goes further out. If you shoot it further than that, it goes further out and eventually it'll just follow the horizon. And if you shoot it far enough, it'll just go whoop right back around as long as there's nothing there to slow it down. So as long as you get out of the air, out of the atmosphere that slows you down, guess what? You can just keep orbiting. You can keep falling around the earth continually that's all these rockets are doing that's all a rocket does oh there we go those are the bye-bye batteries so now it freed up you know think of it as like ditching a bunch of dead weight you know it just lost a bunch of weight on its shoulders it, it has less mass Safety to push forward phenomenal. increasing the delta v successful hot swap of our batteries and electron is performing nominally yeah. Five just to recap we had successful ignition stage one burn and stage separation and now we're following stage two as it continues to orbit this burn will continue until around T plus nine minutes, and then our kick stage will separate. 80 seconds remaining. Um, I don't want to even address some of the people in the chat room talking about uh, things that they clearly don't have much of an understanding of. But as a photographer, I will tell you one phenomenon that is uh, common with non-rectilinear lenses, uh, and that is pinch distortion and 
uh, the distortion of a lens. So if you're using a wide angle lens like this is, um, there's oftentimes, so you'll notice, say you had a, a flat line, a straight line. If you increase the, the pitch of it, the, the line will curve like this in this direction. Copy if you F increase percent. it the other way, it'll go that way. So if this rocket turns all of a sudden, um, you'll have a better understanding 30 seconds remaining. of the shape of our own planet. We have about 30 seconds remaining in the stage two burn. Electron is following a good trajectory and propulsion is nominal. <laughs> um, people ask about space junk. Like, are all these new startups uh, any concern with space junk, space debris? Um, that's what I love about Rocket Lab. They're really good stewards of space. They. Yes. Transfer all that appears nominal. Staging. So now just that kick stage separation. We might not have a ground tracking station there, so don't don't panic yet. That call confirms stage two engine shutdown and kick stage separation. The kick stage is now entering a coast phase for around 40 minutes before the Curie engine will ignite Based to circularize its orbit and deploy the payloads. We We're going to take a break and come back in approximately 40 minutes for the final payload deployment. In the meantime, sit back, relax, and enjoy watching Electron's path as it orbits the Earth. Well, that was awesome, guys. Uh, how I, I love this company. I love that rocket. And um, I, I did want to point out one thing. You might notice Rocket Lab is using everyday astronaut music. This song is called Slow Orbit. It's not even out yet. Um, it's one of those songs that I had released um, just on... Ooh, is my internet taking a crap? Potentially. Let me just refresh the stream here real, real quick. Um, but yeah, they're using a song called... Uh, slow Orbit, there, and there's going to be three songs in there, so, um, hey, look at that. <sighs> I hope that's not my internet. Is that my internet? Might just have a little, the clock's ticking. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> There we go. Got the sexy jams going now. Let me know if you guys need me to turn it up or down. I just want to chill in the background music. Uh, yeah, so they they use some of my songs for their coast phases, which is a big, big, big honor for me. Uh, I couldn't be more excited about that. Uh, so there's going to be three songs that play this evening, uh, and hopefully we see them use it in future launches as well, which brings me to, if you want, you can go to everydayastronaut.com slash music now their levels are kind of getting a little wonky um i do have my first album out maximum aerodynamic pressure it's available hopefully everywhere you listen to music if you don't want to just if you're too lazy to type in everyday astronaut on spotify or itunes or google play or Tidal or amazon music or wherever uh you can go to everydayastronaut.com slash music and you'll be able to find my album right here with easy links. Otherwise, just get on Amazon, get on iTunes, get on Spotify, especially Spotify. It's been doing pretty well on Spotify. So show your friends. There's also a, a YouTube playlist right here uh, with cool background videos as well. Um, I probably should be doing this so you can actually see it a little bit better. But um, yeah, if you haven't checked out my new, my new album, Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure, please do that now. Uh, click it on your phone, download it, stream it, enjoy especially if you're like studying i feel like it's good chill study music so all right time to answer more questions uh let me switch this back to here turn it up turn it up okay i'll turn it up just a little bit let me know if that's okay i don't want it to be i know me talking over music is sometimes bad so all right let's answer some questions um Okay, so I Iconium 9000, can I talk about why they use helium tanks? Okay, so here's the deal. There are pumps sucking in rocket fuel, right, in these tanks. So you have, you have a tank, you fill it up with rocket fuel, you fill it up with liquid oxygen, and then there's pumps that suck that out, and those pumps then force it into the combustion chamber of the engine, right? 
So if you're taking, um, I feel like here, uh, I want to be able to use my hands better. Uh, so if those pumps are sucking and they ingest any kind of bubble or any kind of air, that's very, very, very bad. So as they're draining the fuel and oxidizer, in order to keep that even pushed, basically like pushed up against the pumps sucking on them, there needs to be some pressure in those tanks. So as they drain fuel and as they drain oxidizer, they maintain the tank pressure by releasing inside those uh, our, our helium, inside really highly compressed helium um, inside what are known as COPVs, compre composite overwrap pressure vessels. Um, and they actually just basically sit there and house those babies. And, uh, and then as the fuel or oxidizer drains, they release that helium, filling in the empty space of the tank to maintain that tank pressure. Um, yeah, I hope that helps answer that. I, I, I probably need to get a way better grasp on that myself before I would do an entire video based on it, but that's basically the principle there. Um, yeah. Uh, Matt W, holy crap, almost forgot about this. Thanks for all your hard work. Well, you're welcome. Uh, I love what I do, and I'm glad you guys are here to, to watch and, and and listen and hang out. That means the world to me. Uh, Miles Miller, still going to do that Midwest meetup? I do need to do a Midwest meetup. we got to find something, like some cool launch or something, or somewhere we could all meet up and I could do like a live stream or something that would be make it make the most sense. Um, Joe Dog, make, uh, and I'll let you, just pay attention. Make sure you're following me on Twitter, especially if you're in the Midwest and you want to do a meetup, or Patreon, I'll, I'll let you guys know too. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get that figured out. Joe Dog Mc, McKeel, I call your not a coaster a, a desktop thermal protection device. It keeps a super hot coffee cup from scorching the desk. So they're not entirely pointless. I don't know where mine went. Mine's over there. Hang on. That's not a bad point. It's really not a bad point. Oh, I probably should have pointed out I'm wearing an Electron shirt today. It is definitely Electron Day. I definitely should have mentioned that. Oh, oh, love it. Uh, yeah, the Gridfin Nauta Coasters. Uh, you're right. They they could be thermal protection Gridfins. I don't know. That's awesome. Um, and Brayden, love your videos. Watching from Kangaroo Island in South Australia. Is that just what you call Australia? Kangaroo Island, or is there actually an island called Kang... I gotta look this up now. Hang on. Is there a Kangaroo Island, or is that just like a... This is gonna kill me if I don't know. Kangaroo Island in South Australia. I did not... I T-I-L, today I learned, baby. I had no idea. Well, thanks for saying hi. That's great. Um, Raymond Rogers, thanks for the stream. You're welcome, Raymond. My pleasure. Really my pleasure. And Riley, how you doing, man? Uh, gotta, gotta love Tim debunking Flat Earthers. I try not to, but I just, um, I, we talked about the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, in the Our Ludicrous Future podcast that I talked about at the beginning of the, of the launch. Um, and that's the phenomenon where you, uh, where you don't realize how much you don't know, right? It's like, you, you don't know enough to how much to, you don't know enough about a subject to realize how much you don't even know yet. Um, and I feel like that's the, one of the <laughs> binding phenomenons of conspiracy theorists and stuff. It's like, you don't even have a good enough grasp to know what you don't even know about this subject. As far as like, they'll say some things like, why don't they do this? It's just like, it's an interesting phenomena. And um, I'm all about, I want us to have a strong appreciation for, uh, for what is so beautiful and grand about rocket science. What's so important about space exploration, all the hard work, the engineering, the, the everything that those engineers do and the people studying their lives to make space exploration possible to do data for our earth and our climate and to protect i mean it's just like there's so much there to appreciate and uh i think it's just very 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 important to lift those people up and and celebrate that achievement to to champion and to be here to be basically professional cheerleaders of space flight and and those in the aerospace industry um i think that's what's important and by making sure that the next generation has good role models to look forward to as far as knowing what how how to study how to apply themselves um how to do better in school than i ever did because i was not a good student i wish i had a passion like spaceflight that that drove me uh into studying really hard to to do an, to be an engineer or something like that um it's really important a lot of kids get their information on youtube these days um a lot and uh 
you know, a loud vocal minority can be a very dangerous thing. So um, not spreading misinformation. So, um, yeah. So, Daniel, thank you very much. And, and thanks again, Riley. And Joe, Joe Raider, uh, can I use voice activation in my Tesla to play your music? You know what, Joe? It's not showing up. That's the one place it's not showing up yet. Um, it's, is it called? Or it's not Slacker. I don't. It's, maybe it is Slacker Radio. Whatever the the radio station, uh, the streaming service in Tesla, you cannot find my music or our podcast yet. I don't know what it is about Tesla's uh, wanting to deny me at this point, but. So unfortunately, no, you cannot use voice activation in your Tesla to play my music. I, I do not believe, but try it. Let me know if, if it works, please let me know. Um, yeah, I would love that. Um, let's see, what's my, my favorite mission or future mission? My, okay. Oh, I'm gonna make sure this music's a little bit louder. And then I'm gonna get, we're gonna get nice and bedtimey with you guys. And I'm gonna tell you my favorite story. And it's the story of my favorite mission ever. In 1975, the United States and the Soviet Union, two Cold War enemies, launched two spacecrafts from their native soil. The United States from, of course, Florida, and the, the Soviet Union from Kazakhstan, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And I'm, of course, talking about the mission, the Apollo-Soyuz mission. And on this mission, we had two actual Cold War enemies coming together, docking in space, shaking hands, hugging each other, the first joint mission between two countries. And not only two countries, two war enemies coming together, literally coming together. And sharing meals, drinks, handshakes, stories, and experiences. That's what it's all about to me. I know that's cheesy, and I know that's, like, super, like, hippy-dippy, hug me now, but, like, that's what it's all about. You, you take people that are literally aiming missiles at each other, wanting to, to blow them apart off the face of this Earth, yet, over the common bond of space exploration, they came together. And to me, that is absolutely beautiful that is so vastly important it's that whole border we all share thing it's the idea that you know it's easy for us to, to to tribalize ourselves and to and to totally divide ourselves with really silly divisions i might even not like another neighborhood in my own city and be like oh yeah screw those people over there in the the east side you know whatever or you might be like yeah well i you know you take that another step out and you're like well Forget Illinois, I, yeah, darn you, Illinois, Iowa's way better. You can always find a division, right? And then it's easy to be like, oh, the United States is way better than Canada or whatever, you know, like there's always that division. But as soon as you get off Earth, that's the last division. That's the, that's the border we all share as humans. That's the one border every human shares. So as soon as you leave Earth, you realize like, the, oh, oh, wait, we're all on the same team down here. Oh, weird. And there's a there's an overview phenomenon or, or overlook overview phenomenon that, that a lot of astronauts experience in space where they look back at Earth and they realize, holy crap, like this is this is what what are we doing down there? Why are why do we fight over all these, you know, trivial things? What is going on? And like, I, I think I don't I don't really have a, a true desire myself to, to fly in space. It's, it terrifies me. But I, I do think. If space exploration became more common, like that would be such a unifying thing. Um, especially, just wait until there's an asteroid uh, hurtling towards Earth and we all have to get together to, to destroy that asteroid. I'll tell you what, we'll sure figure out how to get along really quick then, or else n <laughs> we won't be here. And uh, to me, that's what Apollo Soyuz was like the start of, was just that, that what what earth can be together what what humans can accomplish when we come together and put our differences aside um all for the common good of of spreading um you know for for spreading scientific discovery for for exploring our our cosmos and finding out more about where we are in those cosmos to me that's just a beautiful thing so that's all <laughs> uh i get honestly a little bit teary eyed when i just when i think about apollo soyuz Oh man, uh, that's 
easily one of my favorite missions. It's just so, it, it, it means so much. And um, I'm ready for more of those experiences in space flight. So I think another a big one will be, you know, going back to the moon, especially if it's an international thing where multiple nations step off uh, a spacecraft and land and walk on the moon together. Oh, I will be bawling. Same with Mars. Like when, when we eventually get humans to Mars, if it's an international collaboration, which it will be most likely, I'll be bawling. That is like, woo, that's what I like. Oh, yeah. Oh, so there we go. <laughs> Gather around, kids. Uh, there you go. I hope that answers your question, Blaze. Um, Big A, why not use nitrogen to pressure to pressurize tanks? You can, and they do. Some rockets use nitrogen. Uh, you can use nitrogen or helium. Um, inert gases. Um, I, th I don't know why helium is more common, but it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> Malcontent Optimist in our Discord says, It's like how China helped us rescue Matt Damon from Mars. Exactly. It's exactly like that. But it is... Like, f another thing is, don't forget, like, with Apollo 13, we had the Soviet Union, again, saying... You know, if your astronauts don't, if they land in our waters or if there's any way we can help, like, we'll return them to you. We will help aid in the recovery of your astronauts. Like, again, in the middle of war. Like, to me, ugh. Yeah. So, okay, there we go. Uh, Benjamin, thank you. Christopher Jessup. Hey, man. Whoa, Christopher. Holy cow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. Ah, oh, dang. Ah. Uh, Thanks for doing these streams and the knowledge you share. You do an awesome job. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, I'm pretty sure, Christopher, whenever you come around, you're like the top donor every time. I really appreciate that. Um, everyone say thank you. Um, uh, everyone say, say thank you to Christopher. Little uh, light applause to Christopher. Thank you. Get Thank you. That's extremely, extremely, extremely nice of you. Uh, Peter, <laughs> we deserve it. I live in Des Moines. Or I live in Iowa. I don't know why I read that as Des Moines. Probably because I see Des Moines all the time. We live in Illinois. Uh, hey, we're neighbors. We're all on the same little blue marble together. Um, Tom Sales, what does Blue Origin do at their Kent, Washington factory? I believe for now that's actually where they have been producing uh, the BE4 engines. I think that's where they had produced almost everything leading up to New Glenn. I think New Glenn, I think that's just, that was like their existing factory. That's where they developed New Shepard. But I, I, I don't know the relationship yet between that and the one out at Kennedy Space Center. I, I'm assuming a lot of things are starting to move towards Kennedy Space Center. Um, or at least final integration for sure would be at Kennedy Space Center. So maybe they're going to continue engine building and engine development out there in Washington. I don't really know yet. I got to get I got to get some contacts at Blue Origin. I got to get in there and see that stuff because that is uh, that video that I have out about them doing research on them just made me so, so, so stoked. And I want to remind you guys. I had a lot of people going like, shouldn't they learn how to put something in orbit before they talk about going to orbit with a giant rocket? Like, you have to remember, most of the people that probably work for Blue Origin probably have other air, like, it's not like they're a totally fresh company of people starting from ground one. Most of the people that work there probably have some kind of experience in the aerospace industry, at least heading the, the designs on these things. And the... The hardest part about making a huge, huge rocket is financially, it's it's hard. It's not necessarily that, it doesn't scale up. Like if you take a small orbital rocket like the Electron and then you make the world's biggest rocket, I don't think the, the actual mechanics and the issues of the vehicle get exponentially harder with the size of the vehicle. The size of the vehicle doesn't make it harder. The hard part about making it bigger is the tooling and the manufacturing costs. So if you can afford to make a giant, giant, giant rocket that will help your business case, and, and help you undercut other people, yeah, make a giant, giant, giant rocket, even if it's your first orbital rocket. Who cares? Set the new rule. Set the new rule book. Um, that's my opinion. <laughs> uh, Settler, um, thanks for all your great videos. Keep it up. Merry Christmas. Well, thank you, Settler. Uh, that's coming right up, isn't it? I better make sure I've got some presents going. We're only like <laughs> about a week away. Hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Bama Boy, which one of ISRO missions is your favorite and why? So far, I really like their, they've been developing a, a little mini space shuttle thing that's, I think, only flown once so far. Um, but it is going to be like a reusable launch, or a semi-reusable launch vehicle for them. Uh, that's been really cool. I love the mission that they use. They launched 104 CubeSats because it just, just kept uh, dispensing uh, 
into into space 104 cube sets it was really cool that was impressive um i will be doing a video in the near future about isro the indian space agency because they do some incredible things and i need to learn more about them that's really what it comes down to um so thank you mike caps uh thank you mike that's you didn't even ask anything thank you very much um austin uh uh, Butenbach, Butengen, Butengenbach, uh, do a meetup and video, uh, from the Kansas Cosmodrome, Cosmosphere. It's not a bad, a bad idea. Um, I have not been there yet. I, I do need to, that's actually pretty close to my friends in Wichita, I think. I, I need to, I do need to get down there. I'll probably do that someday. Um, Abel Rabbit, thank you. Broccoli, do you think we'll see BFR Hopper Test in 2019? Yeah, I do. Um, I do think we're going to see the the BFR. Well, uh, remember, now it's Starship and Super Heavy, and BFR would have referred to the entire vehicle. I think we'll start seeing Starship hops by the end of 2019. I think they're pushing really aggressively for that. Um, I think we're going to see a really, really big change out of the vehicle. Uh, a really big change. I've been hearing some things. It sounds like it's going to be very different. <laughs> uh we already know that it's uh, they're using a heavy metal now instead of carbon fiber. <sighs> Who knows? I hope that they get out of the design freeze and really just not design freeze, but I, I hope they get out of willy willy nilly design changes and get into actually getting like more concrete and ready for the new rocket. So, yeah. Mm hmm. All right. Broccoli 32. Do you think? Sorry, my throat hurts. I did a live stream this morning. I just get like all exhausted when I do live streams. Uh, Bracket 3, do you think it was, oh yeah, that was what I already said. You need to check out this, the Stafford Air and Space Museum in, in Weatherford, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Yes, I have heard of that. Um, I will go visit that sometime. I have good friends in Oklahoma that I need to visit. Um, yeah, Logan, I'll come visit you and I'll check out the, uh, the Stafford Air and Space Museum. Um, Nathan Rigby, Blue Origin is building a manufacturing facility in Huntsville, Alabama. They are? I didn't realize that. Really? I know that, um, huh. I don't think I realized that. I need to, uh, look into that because I'm confused what they would need there. Um, I know the, in Huntsville, or specifically Decatur, is where ULA will be doing the Vulcan rocket, which will use Blue Origin's, uh, BE-4 engines. But I'm really curious what they're going to be manufacturing there in Huntsville. Um, uh, Senin wants to know, has it started? It it took off 30 minutes ago. We're in this coast phase here. You can see on the left-hand part of the screen this gauge going up. And this is when they will do um, the Curie burn. The Curie upper stage will put it into its uh, orbit. And then they'll start deploying their payloads. So, um, yes, it has started. Um, have I seen the Russian historical space drama Salyut 7? No, I have not. I have not seen that. Mm. John Eric, thank you. Uh, John on our Discord channel shows The Verge's article. I'll pull this up here. Um, let me do this. Oh, not that. Come on, term. Is this right? There we go. So BE4 engine is built, being built in Huntsville. Um, let me make it so you can see it, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, today, private space flight, blah, blah, blah. Huntsville, state of the art facility in Huntsville, Alabama. Mm. Yeah, that's crazy because they have Kent, Washington. They have their site in Texas. They also have that huge, huge, huge plant in, uh, at, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That's crazy though. Well, yeah, maybe it's so it can be integrated onto the Vulcan upper stage really close, just down the street. Hmm. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the knowledge drop. Um, let me pull this back up. So, um, <laughs> no, not answering that. I don't have any interest in those YouTube channels. Uh, Le, uh, Ladija, yes, you did miss the launch. Um, uh, my friendly reminder for those of you wanting to make sure you don't miss out on launches, there are apps like Launch Alarm, uh, SpaceX Now for just SpaceX launches. Of course, you can check out my website, everydayastronaut.com, 
and you can click anytime you want. It's not an app, but it, you know, I don't know. You don't necessarily need an app for everything. Uh, if you want to see upcoming launches, just check here. You can tell here that we are 34 minutes um, after T minus zero of the Electron mission. So, yep, go to prelaunchpreviews.com or everydayastronaut.com backslash prelaunch previews. I should probably make that a URL too. But yeah, there you go. Uh, just stay on top of it that way. You can also get even alarms and things using some of those other apps. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Um, yeah. Every Tesla owner should listen to Spaceships for Earth and Moon Dance while driving. Just Bluetooth it. There you go. I love it, Joe Raider. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's good, like, road trip music. I I really do. Um, I, I kind of wrote it, yeah, when doing that kind of stuff, too. So, um, oh, yeah, talking about Mova Globes. These are – so I did a video. Don't forget, guys, if you are wanting space gifts to or ideas to give to your family and friends – uh, for holidays, if you're a space nerd like me, I did a video and an article all about the best gifts that you could give um, a space fan. I'll just pull this up. Um, so there's a, a YouTube video that I did on here. Um, if you're looking for gift ideas that has a lot of great things, um, like telescopes, book ideas, Nauta coasters, prints, posters, Mova globes, little moons cool shoes, some space swag, and of course, <laughs> maximum aerodynamic pressure by this guy. Who does he think he is? Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, if you're looking for some gift ideas, hopefully that helps. Uh, ben Fraser, I've been listening, I've been to the Kansas, uh, sorry, I'm tired by the way. I was like falling asleep on the couch at 10 and it's one now, so bear with me. I'm sorry if I'm, if I've been like, uh, uh, Ben Fraser, I've been to the Kansas Cosmosphere uh, before the whole illegally selling the artifacts scandal happened, and it's laid out pretty nice. There's a real SR-71 in the lobby and a space shuttle simulator. Huh. I didn't realize they were illegally selling artifacts. Kind of wish I could have some cool artifacts. <laughs> Although illegally uh, obtained probably isn't the best way of doing anything, so... Um, uh, Samuel, when do I think NASA will test EPPP in orbit? I don't even – electric propulsion – propulsion – propulsion? I don't know what uh, – can you guys help me out in Discord? I don't know what EPPP is. Exclusive primary P propulsion. Exclusive propulsion poor people. Uh, that's P-O-R, Spanish. Uh, ex exclusive propulsion for people. Uh, Scott McClay wants to know Firefly or Vector? Um, you know, Vector seems like they're getting closer to flying. Uh, but Firefly, I really like their, their little aerospike cluster idea. It's pretty cool. They also have, they won a contract again. They've won two pretty big NASA contracts now because now they also are in the runnings to be able to do some moon missions for that new moon initiative, which is really cool. Um, external pulsed plasma propulsion engine. That might be external pulsed plasma propulsion. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't know much about the external pulsed plasma propulsion engine, unfortunately, uh, Samuel. Otherwise, I would love to give you a little more deep rundown on that, but I... I, I, I don't know anything about that. It, definitely not enough to even know what its acronym ne means. So I will uh, I'll have to read up on that. But hmm, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, right now it seems like Vector is getting closer to, to launching something into orbit, hopefully relatively soon with their Vector R rocket. Um, I would love to see. I just want them both to do well. I don't think we have to pit them against each other necessarily. Um, Firefly has some really cool missions like I said, going to the moon and some exciting opportunities there. I hope they both succeed. I hope they both kick butt. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, fire, how could you not want to fly a Firefly class vessel? That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I. Uh, why is liquid methane suddenly be considered as a rocket fuel? That's a really good question, Redbeard. I, I, think, some, I think Scott Manley probably has a video on that, if I remember right. Um, if not, that, that is a video topic I really wanted to talk about. It has some advantages. The hard thing I'm trying to figure out is why it hadn't been used until now. 
Like, it seems like a pretty basic idea. It kind of combines some of the best qualities um, of RP1, of kerosene, and of hydrogen. It, it's more efficient than kerosene, uh, yet it still has a, a decent amount of... It seems like a good middle ground, and one of the best things about it is that it doesn't coke up your engines at all. Like, it doesn't have... Um, a big thick carbon buildup it actually kind of cleans your engines and your turbo machinery um so i i'm a little bit confused why it took this long for methane to become a propulsion choice um or the most sought after one it seems like so yeah alex Tut, thanks for staying up for the launch the baby and i are enjoying a sleepless night oh no keep up the good work well thank you alex sorry to hear that the the baby's keeping you up uh yeah that's something i I'm very nervous for someday if I were to ever become a father would be those sleepless, sleepless nights. Oh, parents, you guys are crazy. I, all, a lot of energy. It takes so much energy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Eden, if, am I ever going to interview Chris Hadfield? There's better ways of, of asking that question on YouTube here. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have any to be. I love Chris Hadfield. I love Chris Hadfield. Uh, I don't know if I have anything to ask him. Like I here's okay. Here's a, a realization I had recently. And this, I'm, I'm not saying that I, I love astronauts. Astronauts are awesome. Like they are, I don't have anything that it takes to be an astronaut. Those people are awesome. Especially nowadays. Like it, back in the day, it used to be so much of a military thing, like test pilots that were crazy, almost borderline stupid because they're putting their lives insanely at risk with, unproven technology and doing things that uh, by today's standards would be just absolute death wishes. Um, that was one thing. Today's uh, today's astronauts are like literally like flying scientists. They're doing things that are so important to Earth and, and doing research that can only be done in space. Um, that's extremely important. But one of the things that I realized, you know, speaking of like Chris Hadfield and stuff, one of the things that I really am personally in love with is the hardware. I love rockets. I love watching a rocket fly. I love seeing the design challenges evolve, seeing a, a, a problem like, hey, we want to try to recover a 15 story, 25 ton booster uh, on a, a drone ship the size of a, a football field. Like I love that challenge and watching the engineering tweaking happen in real time. Um, I love the idea of big, huge, crazy spacecraft that are going to get us to the moon and to Mars. I love that stuff. And there's, I personally, I like trying to champion the people that, that make that stuff work. The people that go out there and spend countless hours doing the engineering, um, crunching the numbers, doing the boring things like not boring company, but doing, um, you know, maybe some obscure little study on some weird you know, heat element on this type of titanium screw that they might do for three months. It's tedious work maybe, but there's so much that goes into refining and honing in spaceflight hardware. And I'm just, I think my job as a science communicator, I, I, I will get really excited when we start flying humans again. I'll start, you know, from the US. I think I'll be paying more attention to it. Um, the whole Soyuz thing, I'm, I just don't know enough about to really even get like the ISS and Soyuz just has never really quite clicked with me as much as like, I don't know. So to get on that, I think I will, I will be, um, a little more excited again when I, when I am familiar with the spacecraft, like I know the CST 100 Starliner pretty well. I know the Atlas five pretty dang well. I know dragon two and I know Falcon nine really well. So putting humans on vehicles that I know really well will probably help click over for me something and unlock a little bit more of that human element. But for now, I feel like a big part of my job is to communicate um, some of the principles, the physics, the engineering challenges, and help lift up and and kind of, you know, astronauts can sometimes get all the glory, but really it's the people on the ground working, you know, 80 hour weeks to make sure this stuff happens. That's that's one of the things that I think it's, it's part of my job is to help provide that perspective and that appreciation. Um, but that being said, yeah, I would love to interview Chris Hadfield. <laughs> Longest rant ever. Uh, <laughs> uh, Matt Dewinsky, I'm, I'm using next space flight, uh, on Android. There you go. It has many reminders to launch and links to live streams also scheduled for upcoming with some descriptions. That's a great note. There you go from Matt. Thank you. Um, yes, tomorrow is a great show. T M R O. Um, 
let's see, how do they go about chilling the tank, or is it just the methane that chills the tank? Like, does the tank have to be pre-chilled? I'm not sure. I, I, I know that, um, I know that specifically SpaceX, well, and Blue Origin will be using hydrogenous pressurization, and there's some kind of cool equilibrium balance with, with hydrogenous, uh, or autogenous, sorry, not hydrogenous, uh, autogenous pressurization, which is like, as one of the, you know, if you have two fluids and uh, two cold things at two slightly different temperatures, as one bleeds off, I don't, I'll, I'll get it totally wrong. I, I got to learn how to how to explain this, and I have to learn it for myself before I really even try to explain it to you guys. But basically, my understanding is like, this equilibrium happens where as one boils off, it can pressurize the next tank, and then that one gets a little warm, boils off, and pressurizes the opposite and they just sit in this equilibrium automatically and autogenously pressurizing themselves. Um, yeah, I, I so I don't really have a perfect answer for that. So, sorry. Um, oh, I love, by the way, notice, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed on the screen here. I'm going to pull this up. Um, they have been showing the little electron. It's coming up. If you live uh, off the coast of Portugal... You know, north, uh, northern Africa here, or if you're in Ireland, uh, you probably won't see anything because it's, or wait, is it nighttime? It, it would have to be the exact right conditions. It'd have to be just pre-dawn or just, uh, yeah, I, I'm, it, I don't think you're going to see it because it's tiny and doesn't have big reflective solar panels or anything. So you won't see anything, but just wave. It's coming over you any second, any second. Um, Luija Zaborski wants to know, how long will SpaceX take to build the BFR? Please. Um, there's two things that you never want to, that don't matter when you're talking about spaceflight, and that's timelines and money, because no matter what you say, it's going to change. Absolutely, there's no point in even speculating too much about time or money, because it comes when it comes, and it costs how much it's going to cost is honestly what I've learned in the past couple years of really paying attention to this stuff is it doesn't, I don't know. They don't know. That's why when Elon was getting so frustrated at that Dear Moon press conference when literally three or four different people were just trying to pin him on how much was the BFR going to cost to develop. If they knew, like, you never know. Unknown things come up all the time. I can't tell you how much it's going to cost for me to eat tomorrow. You know, like, variables happen in something as simple as that. So trying to plan out... Uh, the world's largest rocket with uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of moving parts. Uh, things change a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, so what you're saying is it acts like an alcohol still. I don't know actually too much about um, alcohol fermentation, but I guess that uh, if that's, yeah, if, if methane does autogenous pressurization like an alcohol still, then yes, I guess it, it would act like an alcohol still. Yeah. There you go. Um, everyone say hi to tomorrow, T-M-R-O on here. If you guys aren't uh, subscribed to tomorrow, what are you doing? If you're looking for, like, if you want me to do a podcast, which I do, again, remember, uh, I do have this podcast, Our Ludicrous Future, that you guys need to be, um, that you guys need to be following. But if you're not, if you want more content like this, you know, long form content, you need to be, subscribe to tomorrow t-m-r-o look at this these guys deserve a hundred times this amount of followers they, they deserve a mil like three million subscribers because the content they produce is absolutely incredible um they've taught me many 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 lessons <laughs> in production and in in life <laughs> uh, i love everyone involved with tomorrow so if you aren't following tomorrow Go right now. I'll take a break. I'll, I'll sit here for a while. I'll let you navigate away and look up tomorrow, T-M-R-O, and hit the subscribe button to them because, yes, please do. Please do. Tune in every Saturday. They do a live show every Saturday. Um, it's just awesome. Look at this from three years ago, India's Human Space Program. I need to watch that and I'll learn about, about that. Yeah, just watch this, guys. Watch this stuff. Watch it every Saturday. Oh, I miss them. Hi, everyone at tomorrow. I miss you guys. Um, yeah. So we're getting uh, we're getting really close. I'm going to pull the live stream back up here. Hopefully we're only like... Uh, we're getting really close to the Curie burn. 
Look, it's going to happen really close to Ireland. That's fun. You guys probably can't even see that. Sorry. Um, there we go. Falcon Heavy launch should be before June. Uh, someone must have... There we go. Ben Credible. Hello, Ben Credible. Hello, Carrie Ann. Hello, Higginbotham's. Um, yeah, tomorrow is pr pronounced tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I always have to spell it out T-M-R-O because if I tell you to go look up tomorrow on YouTube, uh, it probably won't get you to the right place. So, yeah. Um, yes, I'm glad you guys all subbed. Thank you. Hi, Minnesota. Hi, best buddy. Good work, everybody. Uh, uh, Pierre wants to know what I think about ISRO. I just went on a little ISRO rant like four minutes ago. I love ISRO. I, I need to do way more due diligence in learning more about ISRO because they're doing some incredible things and uh, for like crazy uh, on a very small budget they're doing insanely impressive things like a cryogenic upper stage already that's an advanced thing to have figured out um especially I think they're gonna probably start launching humans way before I uh, even am caught up on them and they're gonna be blowing me away I need to I need to start paying attention to them I love their the GSLV they're producing some awesome space flight stuff, doing some really cool science. Um, I need to start paying better attention, and I need to make a video about them. Um, ooh, I think we're coming back. I think we're coming back. Maybe. Welcome back to the live broadcast of Rocket Lab's Alana 19 mission for NASA. Following liftoff at 7.33 p.m. local time, Electron successfully reached orbit. We're about to ignite the Kickstage's Curie engine to circularize the payloads to a 500 by 500 kilometer orbit. After the burn is complete, the payloads will be deployed in a pre-programmed sequence. So I'm not sure if we'll have visuals on this. Stage three into the connection. The kick stage is a unique final stage of the launch vehicle and provides Electron the capability to precisely inject customer payloads into their final designated orbit, as this graphic explains. Stage 2 takes the kick stage to an elliptical parking orbit. Then the kick stage separates. We leave the second stage in an elliptical orbit with a low perigee, or the lowest point in the orbit. At each perigee, it dips lower and lower into the Earth's atmosphere finally burning up on re-entry. This means we're not leaving large second stages on orbit for years to create space debris, an important point for us here at Rocket Lab. After a coast phase, the kick stage's Curie engine ignites and circularizes the orbit. Once the kick stage has deployed all payloads, the Curie engine has the ability to reignite and perform a deorbit maneuver, enabling it to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up, leaving nothing in orbit but the satellite payloads. See, important. Good space stewards. And stage three engine shut down. I can't. I can't. And we've reached the end of the kick stage burn. Payload deploy will follow shortly. I wonder if we get a camera view. Hopefully we hear. So, so right now the upper stage, the there's a Curie kick stage, and that's basically like a mini third stage. Did its apogee kick that makes it circularize into a 500 by 500 kilometer orbit, and then it's gonna start. They have these little Maxwell dispensers, and they'll just start popping out the payload, and that's gonna be their. Now we're coming up deployment. on payload deploy. This animation simulates the payload deployment sequence, which will see multiple cubesats deploy from the payload plate. All payloads are attached to Rocket Lab's payload plate, which you see here. The positioning of the CubeSats is kind of like a giant game of Tetris, where we need to keep the plate balanced, but also ensure each satellite has a clear path for deployment. It's also important to calculate the best order and timing to release the CubeSats. We can't just deploy all of them at once, as we need to provide enough spacing between each satellite in the orbit. Let's watch the rest of the simulated deployment.
And there you have it. The payload deploy sequence has finished and the mission is complete. Sweet. Look at how dark it is. Look Thank you for joining us for today's historic launch, NASA's first dedicated mission for small satellites. Our mission here at Rocket Lab is to open access to space by providing frequent and reliable launches for small satellites. For photos, footage, and post-launch updates on today's mission, follow Rocket Lab on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our customer, NASA. We'll be back in the new year with the next Electron mission. This is Mission Control Auckland signing off. Awesome. Congratulations. Oh, I'm glad we made it through. I got, I'm getting so tired. It's so late here for me. But congratulations, Rocket Lab. Congratulations, NASA. Uh, the first venture class mission. That's awesome. That's a, it's a really cool thing. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around with me here. Picture perfect. Uh, I can't believe how quickly it got dark there. It must have had a storm rolling in there in New Zealand. Uh, luckily, it looked like perfect timing then for my friends. Again, Trevor Malman and Brady Kenning Keniston, uh, two awesome launch photographers, are down there from the United States, down in New Zealand, uh, taking pictures of that rocket launch. So it looked like it was a gorgeous, picture-perfect day. So hopefully they got some – I know they'll end up with some amazing photography. Um, so I can't wait to see those as well. Um, it looks like they lucked out because if it had taken off an hour later, it would have been a lot darker. Um, so, yeah. Um, thank you guys again for sticking with me this whole time. We have two more launches coming up. Let's just check out these launches. I'm going to pull this up. Uh, let's see. When are these launches going to go? We have, uh, the next one is in two days, six hours. So, um, this will be, uh, 8 a.m. for me. I'll have to get up at like 7.30, um, on Tuesday. That's going to be the, uh, Falcon 9 rocket launch. And then later that night, I'm not going to do the Soyuz launch, but I will be doing the Delta IV Heavy. Uh, that got scrubbed from more than a week ago or about last Tuesday or something. I don't remember exactly when that was, uh, or that was that last weekend it got scrubbed. Yeah, it was, I think it was last weekend. Then it got pushed to Tuesday, got scrubbed from Tuesday. Now it's going to be Tuesday night, um, Tuesday, December 18th at, um, about eight o'clock PM my time. So yeah, 157 UTC. So those are going to be the next two. I'll be doing two on Tuesday. I have a lot of stuff that I need to get ready before then. Ah, uh, Christopher. What are you doing, man? Dang. Oh, man. Everyone, uh, thank you so much, Christopher. That's crazy. Ah, oh, you're nuts. Thank you so much. That's everyone... On my behalf, please give some claps to Christopher. Thank you so much. Dang. Dang. Um. <laughs> tomorrow says, I don't want to hear you complaining about waking up early for the Falcon 9 launch. Says Tomorrow, who may or may not produce the Falcon 9 webcast. That means he's probably going to have to be there like, oh, and they're two hours ahead. He probably won't go to bed that night. He'll probably just stay and work and start producing at like 3 a.m. or something ridiculous. Ouch. You're right. I do. N <laughs> I'm like, oh, I have to be up at 730. Oh, <laughs> and Ben's over there crapping his pants. Touche, uh, touche, touche. Uh, but yes, again, thanks, Chris. Um, <laughs> that's so awesome. I love you guys. I love that everyone's cheering for him. Thank you, Chris. Um, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Chris, you should just be a, a two month moonwalker. If you're a Patreon supporter, you could have some cool access to things. So make sure you remember if, if you want that, you can just go to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Uh, you would get your name and some credits of videos and things like that. So don't forget, I, I have that. And if you don't have to donate, that would have been two months worth of moonwalking or like eight months worth of uh, of commanders. Let's see. Where do I – how do I do this? Click on here. Um, yeah, you could have done moonwalkers. Look at – yeah, these – or commander. You could have done eight months of commanders. But, yeah. But thank you, Chris. Christopher, you're awesome. Uh, I'm going to go to bed, so check out this stuff. Do the things that I tell you when I said all those things. Make sure and if you want to look at more Rocket Lab pictures, you can go to my website. While you're on my website, you can go to the shop. 
You can click around, check out all this cool stuff. Uh, things are coming in stock. Oh, by the way, the shop will be closed uh, from like December 21st through like January 1st or January 2nd or 3rd or something. Totally closed. They will not be shipping for about a two-week period. So place your orders now uh, on things like maybe wait on Monday or Tuesday. A lot of things should be back in stock. Um, so if you're looking for some of those things. Oh, I need to remember to mention if you work in the aerospace industry, if you work on rockets or on space flight, if you work for any of those, you know, NASA, SpaceX, ULA, whoever, uh, you actually get 25% off apparel anytime in my web store. You can click here. There's, it'll shoot you off. You have to send an email verifying that you work for that company, and then you'll get a code for 25% off all apparel. So, um, yeah, you can click on any of these shirts. You can click and do um, – you can get another 25%. Christopher. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> you're crazy. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Again, say thank you to Christopher. Oh my gosh, this I'm I can't even handle this right now. I'm tired. And... Thank you, thank you very much, Christopher. You really don't have to do that, but thank you. That really means a lot. And that encouragement is what helps me want to continue to do what I do, especially on Saturday nights when it's bedtime. So thank you very much. Uh, but come back on Tuesday uh, so I can go to bed now. <laughs> uh, yeah, then last thing. Again, remember, guys, uh, check out the podcast. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Our Ludicrous Future um, if you want to have more content and like a weekly podcast. Um, that's youtube.com slash our ludicrous future lud ludicrous future um, you can also find it on like apple and wherever whatever you listen to stuff like that so um all right uh yeah that's that's it i think oh and check out my music or whatever yeah do that i'm going to bed thank you jonathan thank you everybody for tuning in uh congratulations again to rocket lab and to nasa flawless mission it was beautiful uh I'm speechless. You guys just nailed it. Very, very awesome. All right. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people. We'll see you guys soon. Bye everybody.